Okay, good morning everyone. Um, my name is Michael Nevard. I'm the uh, Head of Research and Development for the HALO Trust. Um, and I'm going to speak today about the kind of field aspect of this, of this project and why, why we're involved um, and what our part in it is. And looking particularly at, as this project is focused on anti-vehicle mines, what they are, what they do to civilians in affected countries, and then the challenges we face trying to remove them. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, the Halo Trust is, uh, an, an, is a charity based in Scotland, and we work in 25 countries around the world with the mission to lead the effort to protect lives and restore livelihoods for those affected by conflict. And our work includes what's known as traditional mine action, including the clearance of landmines, um, the destruction of other explosive ordnance, the provision of mine risk education, um, and the, also in recent times the clearance of IEDs and the management and safe disposal of weapons and ammunition of all types. So our work is spread around the world as you can see. Um, and the problem of anti-vehicle mines is something that we have been facing and dealing with since um, our very beginning in the end of the 1980s. Um, and at the moment, the countries where we particularly face this problem are Angola, Somaliland, Somalia, um, Afghanistan, Cambodia, Nagorno-Karabakh and Ukraine, and we expect it also to be a problem in the Middle East uh, as well as we get more involved in those countries. So it's a widespread problem, it's been around a long time, and we've been working on it for a long time. So just to, for those who are not familiar with the world of landmines, um, just to explain firstly what an anti-vehicle mine actually is. So an anti-vehicle mine is a very large landmine, uh, generally five or more kilograms of explosive, and they're designed to be activated when driven over by a vehicle. So they uh, generally require at least 100 kilograms of weight to go over the top to be activated, and therefore they don't go off when walked over by, by, by a person or an animal normally and this distinguishes them from anti-personnel mines which are designed primarily to injure people an anti-vehicle mine is designed to stop or destroy uh, a vehicle um, of any size or, or, or a tank um, they come in a variety of shapes and sizes and uh, there are some more advanced versions but the, the vast majority are just a simple large explosion initiated by pressure um, they are produced by a wide varieties of countries and the ones shown in this picture um, uh, are from Spain, the United States, South Africa, uh, the People's Republic of China, Yugoslavia, uh, USSR, um, Czechoslovakia and Romania um, and that's just a small selection. So there's, they've come from many different countries and uh, they come in a variety of shapes and sizes but ultimately they can be put into various categories. They were used, they have been used and they are being used extensively in conflicts um, around the world by all types of actors and when they are left behind they cause accidents. Um, I didn't realise Panos was going to use some of my photos <laughs> but uh, uh, you know so they cause civilian accidents. So areas that may have been front lines, areas that may have been fought over or have been you know, targeted by guerrilla groups in various different conflicts are then reused by local people as they go back around their normal business and accidents happen to vehicles of all sizes from trucks and, and buses to, to smaller vehicles, tractors and so on. Um, and not just local people but, you know, other organisations, governments, NGOs and so on providing aid and other things. Um, mine clearance organisations themselves also, sub, you know, sadly have been victim of such strikes. Um, the thing, and GOCHD and SIPRI will talk more about impact in more detail, but one thing to remember with an anti-vehicle mine is that one mine tends to, to injure or kill multiple people um, compared to an anti-personnel mine um, and also destroy a valuable asset if in the form of a tractor or, or a vehicle. So even if it doesn't kill the people inside, it may well destroy someone's Likelihood in the same in the same accident. Um, 
Anti-vehicle mines in particular are used on, have been used on roads and they cause particular disruption to road networks and this can have a, an impact far out of proportion to the number of mines. Just a couple of mines on a road, if there's one anti-vehicle mine accident on a road, people will not use a huge stretch, maybe you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 kilometres of road will go unused uh, because of that one accident um, and that can have very significant effects and that blocks access to services for people and to markets, which we'll hear more about from Georgia later. Um, and in an immediate post-conflict scenario, it also blocks access for aid and for mine clearance as well uh, to reach other areas. So roads are a particular problem, and I'll talk more about why they're particularly challenging to clear as well. Um, and that's why roads are one of the focuses of this uh, A Clear Road Ahead project. Um, Anti-vehicle mines also block productive land. So land which has anti-vehicle mines that could be used for farming. Um, if someone buys a tractor and has an accident on the tractor, they will stop using the land. And again, vast areas of land can go unused, which could be productive. Here are these photos which are from, from Western Afghanistan. Um, large areas uh, were mined and then left unused for over 20 years. Immediately, as we cleared them, they were being reopened, and within one season, were productive. Were productive again, um, and so, again, one or two mines can have a big impact here in terms of how much land is actually blocked. Um, yeah, one of the oddities with anti-vehicle mines as well is the fact that because they don't detonate when people walk over them, people may be using the land on foot quite safely or feeling quite safe and then they buy a tractor or they buy a car, drive down the same road, drive over the same land and then have an accident. So peop people may not be aware that areas are dangerous until they actually raise enough money to invest in a, a piece of more expensive equipment and then have an accident um, at the same time. So we see, we have seen in several countries a kind of delayed, delayed impact of anti-vehicle mines um, as people have got richer, you know, become more um, you know, have become more economically well off um, to afford more equipment than they have an accident. So it's kind of perverse process of, of uh, against development. So how anti-vehicle mines are used in conflicts um, <coughs> depends hugely on the, the history of the particular conflict, the different actors, and particularly on the terrain. Um, there are many different ways to break break these things down. This is one, one way of thinking about it. We can have, in some cases, we have structured minefields. These, this is an area in southern Angola. Each of these red dots is, a, is an anti-vehicle mine. This was a mine belt built to prevent a tank attack on a fixed position. Um, these minefields like this are you know, significant when they are there. Um, there aren't so many of them left in the world. Um, but um, from a clearance point of view, they're relatively straightforward because you know where you know where the minefield is, more or less, and then you just work your way down the line. Other places, such as this is another Western Afghanistan photo, large open areas um, where there's no particular terrain to stop vehicles. Uh, mines are laid over a vast area to try and just disrupt uh, vehicle movements. This Western Afghanistan, this was the Mujahideen laying mines to disrupt Soviet tank movements around the plains. Um, not, many, not a huge number of mines were laid, but there was such a large area that we end up having to clear a lot of ground to find those mines. And again, they block, they did, it's all been cleared now, but they blocked a huge amount of farmland um, and other land, um, a relatively small number of mines. And then the final case is the, the, the kind of the roads and tracks of different types um, which have mines laid on them. And the popular kind of tactic by guerrilla or insurgent forces would be to move behind enemy, you know, move, move behind government lines and lay a few anti-tank mines, anti-vehicle mines on a road that your you know, opposition military is using so that they have accidents with their transport vehicles and so on. Um, those could be laid almost anywhere in some, in some countries. Um, if it's an unsealed road like this one, um, you know, there's no way of knowing where those mines were laid and people may have gone in the dark um, without any sense of, you know, not knowing exactly where they are, just following a trap, then laying a mine and then walking back. Uh, and so have no records whatsoever of where these mines are. And so large, huge areas of road can be contaminated. 
or huge lengths of road are suspect or, you know, we believe they contain mines, but we don't know where they are, and it might only be one or two. So they present a particular challenge from that perspective as well. Um, from the point of view of, of the clearance that we, we have to do of clearing these mines, we, we break mines, anti-vehicle mines, into two main categories. The first being the metal case mines, which are generally all the older models from the 50s, 60s, um, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, and they have a full metal case, and we're talking about this kind of size. They have about two kilos of steel, which makes them extremely easy to detect with a metal detector. Conversely, the more modern, more modern versions, which kind of started coming in the 60s and 70s, have plastic or some Baker-like cases and have extremely small metal components. Um, so they're deliberately designed to be difficult to detect um, and have just the tiniest components uh, hidden, like a tiny spring and a pin or something to, to make the functioning mechanism of the mine otherwise are undetectable to a metal detector, the rest of it. So, the metal case ones are pretty straightforward to clear, um, and we can use specially adapted large metal detectors, these, these large loops here, these frames, um, is a metal detector that's specially adapted to find very large items only, and using this kind of tool, you can clear ground extremely fast. Um, and you can even clear fast enough to mount that on the front of a vehicle and drive along the road slowly um, to detect anti-tank mines. Um, there aren't many other pieces of metal in the road of the same size, generally, so there aren't very many false alarms, um, and that speeds up the whole process as well. And, you know, things always vary, but a team, a team of eight D-miners with, with two of these detectors could probably clear about 10,000 square meters a day in good conditions, um, which is um, pretty significant um, compared to what we can do otherwise. So if we only were facing these metal cased landmines, we wouldn't be having this conference um, because these we can already find <laughs> no problem. So some countries in the world are fortunate in the sense that they only have these and they don't have the, the minimum metal ones, but most places have both. So. Trying to find the minimum metal mines is the challenge, and that's that's what you know. That's what this project is, you know. That's what the technical aspect of this project is focused on, and this is a problem that we have been, you know, battling with for, you know, 10, 15 years or more. And I'll run through now some of the techniques that we do use and have trialled, um, and their limitations and why we still need new approaches to to try and solve this problem. So. Most of the mines we can find with a metal detector. Um, the problem being that we have to make our detector so sensitive that we find such small pieces of metal that the false alarm rate just skyrockets. So um, I was looking at some numbers um, for this. And yes, in Western Afghanistan, where this, again this photo is taken, we were finding approximately 35,000 false alarms for every mine that we found. Um, now the mines are quite sparsely placed, um, but it gives you an idea of just how much these very sensitive detectors will find the tiniest scrap of metal um, on the surface, the tiniest shard, and if it's an area where there's been fighting, it's usually heavily contaminated with metal from fragmentation from other artillery rounds and grenades and so forth, bullets, um, or if it's in an area that's been is populated or near a road, then it'll be there'll be metal contamination from just people's domestic activity. So while this approach works, sometimes it doesn't always work. There are some models of, of anti-vehicle mine we still can't really detect properly. Um, the problem is that you just slow down so much for every tiny scrap of metal that it becomes unfeasibly slow. So that's the limitation of the, uh, the metal detectors in particular. Um, Ground penetrating radar, which the panel's alluded to, is something else we've been using for some time um, for clearing mines of different types. And ground penetrating radar uses a, a radar pulse into the ground on a reflection, and it kind of detects anything that's buried in the ground that is different from the surrounding soil. And it can detect anti-vehicle mines, usually 
quite well. The challenge is that the soil itself and the condition of the soil makes a huge impact on how well it works. Um, it can affect how likely you are to detect, and it can also affect the number of false alarms you get. So in some conditions, um, it's extremely good if you've got very, very uh, homogeneous conditions where it's you know, the same soil type everywhere, then usually it works well. If you're in a more complicated area where there's a mixture of soil types or there is an uneven soil surface or there are tree roots mixed in with the soil, then the radar starts to struggle a bit more. Um, and there are certainly places where it becomes almost unworkable. Again, the number of false alarms rises to a point where it becomes unfeasible. We, the best way it's used is generally is combining, it, combining a metal detector with a radar, um, and that's, the, as you can see here, this, this detector here is combining a metal detector and radar, uh, as is this one, and we'll hear more about the mine hunt uh, later on today. Um, the other thing about radar is that generally, it's very popular with the military for landmine clearance and IED clearance, which means that it tends to come with a big amount of restrictions on it in terms of which countries we're allowed to take it to and the export rules that, that kick in for military dual use equipment has more restrictions. So um, while it works well, we can't even, in some places we, we struggle to even get it to the country that we want to take it to because it's, it's simply not allowed. Um, so um, while it's good in a lot of cases, it's not, it's not, a, it's not possible to use it everywhere. Um, another approach is to use kind of what they're called mechanical methods of using large machines, armoured machines, to dig up the soil and, and sift it for mines in various different ways, and there's different approaches one can take. You have the kind of tillers which dig through the soil and break up the mines. We have very simple excavation tools that dig up and find the mines. We have this called, called a rotary mine comb that kind of stirs through the soil um, and will gradually lift up any mines um, and expose them and then even simpler kind of rakes that rake through the ground and pull out any mines. Now, these, these tools all work well in some conditions and less well in others, um, and also come with the fact that you need to buy a very expensive machine to start with. Um, one of these armoured machines is not a, you know, it's not a simple thing to, to purchase or to, uh, to get to the place that you want to use it. Um, and then once you've got it there, you need to support it with fuel, with logistics and spare parts, mechanics and so on. So machines are extremely good in some areas and in fact are far more efficient than other methods in the right conditions. Um, but again, they're not, they're not uh, portable enough to go to every, every scenario. And the biggest issue with machines really is, is its effect on the ground. So as you're churning through the ground by whatever method, um, probably the first, you're talking about the top 20 to 30 centimetres of the soil, um, you're obviously you know, destroying the soil, such soil, soil structure in the process. Um, in some cases, where people are going to farm immediately onto that ground, it's actually good. People can, it's almost, it's being pre-ploughed, they can sow seed straight into the ground. So in some cases it's ideal. In other cases, you might, get, you might just be causing excessive erosion, which is clearly not good. Um, and in other cases, if it's a road that you're destroying, then you may have destroyed the road that you're trying to you know, open, um, and therefore may have achieved nothing um, in the short term. So again, in some cases, we've had to stop using mechanical clearance because of the damage, the effect on the ground itself um, was, was too great. Um, Uh, another approach that's used or talked about using is animal detection systems, so the use of, of trained <coughs> dogs or in some cases rats to, to sniff the presence of explosive vapour. Um, this method is, a, you know, is highly dependent on environmental conditions and it's all about the, how the vapour comes from the mine that's buried through the soil up to the surface um, and then you know, how it can be detected by the, by the animal. Um, in Halo, we don't use these this for anti-vehicle mines clearance, um, as we couldn't, we couldn't, we weren't, we weren't convinced that it was consistent enough for our requirements. Um, and in addition, while it it's, can be very cost-effective when it's running well, the startup cost and the overhead cost of managing an animal detection system is extremely high. Um, 
And unlike a detector, you can't put a dog back in its box at the end of the day and lock it in a container and go home. So it requires an overhead, consistent overhead, which, uh, which is very costly in, in some cases, countries in particular. Um, um, some, there has been some talk, of, you know, people talk about using explosives, kind of chemical sniffers, as opposed to uh, electronic chemical sniffers, as opposed to um, animal sniffers. We've never seen, I've never seen a version of that that was being touted actually for clearance. But uh, if that did work, we still struggle with this question of, of the vapor and whether the vapor or not is present. So, that's an idea of some of the different technologies that we have looked at and their limitations. And I just want to talk particularly about the challenges of working on roads. So in, in my experience, when you're using detectors, you're detecting first, which is the, usually the easy part, is to detect something. The tricky part is then you have to safely expose that thing to check what it is. So you need to safely excavate the ground to see, is it a mine or is it just a piece of you know, metal rubbish, for example, that you can discard. So the condition of the ground makes all the difference in the world to the productivity. Um, and so hard, compacted roads slow down a lot. Um, uh, that's often the worst possible ground to be in. Roads, because they have a lot of people using them generally, um, usually have high metal contamination. They can be very uneven and, and damaged because of ruts and so on, which make it difficult to determine um, where you need to go. And as I mentioned before, rehabilitating the road surface can also be a significant challenge um, in some places. Um, I mentioned one example in particular. Um, roads are often, in some, in some cases, running very close through towns and villages, um, which could also be a challenge if people are walking around at the same time that you're trying to conduct clearance because you have to have safety evacuation distances for safe clearance. Um, and so you may have to be closing a road that people are using as a footpath while you do clearance, which is not an easy thing to do necessarily. Um, roads in some countries are hard to even find where they are. And in this drone image from Somaliland, where we have multiple tracks running through the bush, um, and although we know oh, there was a mine accident somewhere here, we don't know which track was where when the mines were laid. The tracks move daily almost or weekly through the, through the seasons as people try to get better traction or go around an obstruction of some kind or, you know, um, and people just pick different routes through. So we end up coming back 15, 20 years later to try and work out which road it was that was actually mined in the first place. Um, and all that means is what we normally have to do is just clear a much larger chunk of ground than simply a three meter wide track. Um, and so again, we end up clearing larger areas for a small number of mines, but that's simply the reality of, of, uh, of, of the situation in these places. So again, that just slows us down um, as well. Um, I'll mention particular sandy roads in southeast Angola, because this is a problem we have been fighting with for a very long time and have made not much headway on. In southeast Angola, it's quite, it's very sandy terrain, you're on the edge of the Kalahari Desert ultimately, um, and was heavily mined, um, particularly with this um, so-called, it's the South African number eight anti-vehicle mine. Um, it happens to be the one in the world that we encounter that's most difficult to detect with a metal detector. And ultimately, metal detectors are not much good to soft to find these. And so we've had to resort to other methods. Um, unfortunately, for mechanical, so we did try a mechanical solution in those areas. And there are many hundreds of kilometers of road potentially contaminated with these mines. Um, we did try mechanical methods, but the destruction to, of the road surface of the track the small amount of root matter that existed in the tracks is destroyed by the machine to such an extent that the road is not passable anymore. Um, and therefore, you've not really solved the problem at all. So we have to stop doing that approach primarily. Um, we've also tried ground penetrating radar in various forms. But again, this dry sand with, with lots of tree roots in was very, very bad conditions for the radar. Um, 
And although it found the mines, no problem, it also found every single route um, virtually, um, which was not an encouraging thing to clear either. So um, that approach was also problematic. But the, the impact is very real down there. Um, and this is an example of a track that Halo had actually checked. Um, and someone had pulled off to the side um, for some reason and had an accident. So um, if, we, if we clear the road of the machine but destroy the road, people will then turn off to the side to try and get better traction and then potentially have an accident on another mine. So um, we have to be very careful about that. And this right now is a kind of unsolved technical problem that we have on a considerable scale. Um, and it's certainly one of, one of the motivations behind our involvement in this, in this project in particular. So, oops. So yes, we, we have been involved in this project from, its, from, its, uh, from the earlier discussions um, with Jamie and Panos several years ago. And it's precisely because we have places where we cannot detect the mines. We don't have a sensible solution to find the mines quickly um, and accurately. And we hope that the nuclear quadrupole resonance approach, which Jamie will talk about later, will be a tool that will work in some of those areas where those other tools fail. Um, no tool works in every scenario, that's an uh, unrealistic expectation, but we hope that it will provide that extra you know, edge that can, can really change the situation in, in, in those difficult scenarios. As Panos said, it's looking for the explosive directly, which is an approach that none of the other technologies take. Um, so we hope that will be to our advantage. Um, and ultimately, we want to reduce those false alarms um, so that we can, we can, we can do clearance at a, a sustainable efficiency rate. Um, we're, obviously, we're also involved in the, the socio-economic elements of this project as well. And you know, that, those elements, which we'll be spoken more about later, are to do with understanding the impact, um, understanding the impacts of, of, of anti-vehicle mines. And again, we are keen to see, to, to learn about, more about that. Um, and we hope that that will help us plan our work better, in one sense, and also hopefully communicate our, communicate our needs better when it comes to, to raising money for, for clearance as well. So persuading people that anti-vehicle mines are a significant problem that require, require support. Um, I think it's, it's probably fair to say that anti-vehicle mines have been somewhat less talked about um, over the last 10 years than anti-personnel mines. Um, and there's been a concerted effort by HALO and others to, to kind of raise the profile of anti-vehicle mines as a problem to make sure it gets the attention that it deserves. And this is certainly, certainly part of that. Um, so, yes, yeah, so um, as Pana said, we're contributing to this project in terms of explaining our requirements and hopefully organizing field trials and so on uh, in the future. Um, and kind of giving the detailed feedback that will shape the project um, and the, the technology and the other and the other elements of the project in a way that's that's actually going to be most most effective on the ground. Um, so yes, I guess just say thank you to the EPSRC Engineering Physical Research Research Council for funding this this project, which we hope will be uh, we look forward to. Um, taking through to its conclusion. Um, obviously, HALO is a, is a charity. We are funded by our donors, so all of our work is supported by the generosity of our donors, both institutional and private. Um, and I've just finished by paying tribute to our staff. Well, we have 8, 000, more than 8,000 staff around the world, and they're the ones who are out there every day clearing landmines. So um, they're the ones who you know, deserve the credit, and we hope this will give them the tools to also help our beneficiaries. So those people, we are trying to reach the communities in cut-off cut -off villages in southern Angola, for example, that have had no access, uh, no road, road access for almost a generation. Um, we hope this project can lead to, to greater support from, for them as well. Um, so thank you. That's all I have. Uh, uh, when you identify the device, um, do you more commonly render it safe or function it under control conditions? 
we normally do a controlled demolition in situ. Yeah. That's it's usually the simplest and safest thing to do. And yeah. how does that work in more so That's a, that is a challenge. In some cases, we would then render safe if, if um, there are buildings within the kind of blast radius. Um, and in certain scenarios, that has, does happen, yeah. Um, but we, we try to avoid that if we can. There are, there are measures you can take if things are not too close to reduce any damage to glass and so on. But, uh, um, yeah, we, we have the option to do that if, if, if we need to. Hi, um, Jenny, when you have, you were talking about the different types of mines with the predominantly metal and the other ones where the, the metal uh, quality is very minimal. Generally, in the same location, do you experience different types of mines presence or generally if you have the metal ones you will not expect the others and vice versa um sadly it's usually not very predictable in some places we have good idea of what to expect um in cambodia for example we have only really fine the metal ones um, the other ones were not used but in more in places like angola or afghanistan where the wars went for a long time a lot of different actors providing um you know, selling, selling arms basically of different types. We see the kind of big variety of different types. So um, in Angola, we see all types mixed together, ultimately. Um, and so that, that's a big, it's certainly a big problem because if, we know that the, if you know that the minimum metal ones are around, then you kind of have to assume that they're there um, and you can't rule them out. So that's, that's, that's a challenge. Um, particularly because they're used in low numbers, just ones and twos here and there. It's very hard to try and get that information back. Um, for those not familiar with mine action, there's a process called non-technical survey, which is where teams travel around visiting communities and gathering information on landmine contamination. So you ask local people, where do you think, where do you know there are mines? Where have there been accidents? Where have you seen, you know, military activity, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And then trying to find, if we can, you know, okay, well the soldiers were here. Let's try and find the soldiers and do they remember where they put the mines? That's what we try to do um, as the first stage before deciding where to then do our clearance. Um, in some places, you get really good information. They say, yes, they're just here, here, and here. There are 23 of them, you know, off we go. In other places, the person who laid the mines might not be there. They might no longer be alive. Um, you know, that information has disappeared. And so we can't recreate it very in much detail. And in those places, then, we have to assume the worst um, and uh, clear larger areas and so on. So, that's a, it's a big challenge in some countries with very complicated conflicts. Um, but even in more recent conflicts like Ukraine, record keeping of mine laying has been very poor, and you know mines have already kind of dis disappeared into the into the ground, as it were, and it's going to be hard to find them again. Um, yeah. Sure. Maybe we've got a couple, two more, and then. Uh... Thank you. Um... In instances such as the one you presented in Angola, when there are sandy roads and machinery pretty much destroys the road, but it seems to be a very effective method in terms of clearance. Has there, has there been any um, situation when, um, say, authorities um, support that process and then there is a repavement or a reconstruction of the road? That's something we've certainly looked at a little bit in the past and didn't have much success. It's actually something we're going to going to have a look at again. Um, we're going back to some of those areas and having another this year, having another push forward. We hope maybe that approach will, will bear through. As it, it's actually quite difficult there because there isn't. It's the sandy area is huge, and so there isn't anywhere even nearby to go and collect hard rock to then make the road. It have to be transported hundreds of kilometres. So. It'd certainly be a very significant challenge, but I think that's one approach: is either looking at that, or even, even kind of replanting or re-sowing um, plants that might hold the ground together is also another approach. But yeah. Thanks. Yes. Oh, 
Michael, very si simple question. Um, have you come across any anti-vehicle mines with anti-tamper mechanism? We have. We have. Um, and in all honesty, most of the time, because we simply destroy the mine, we don't even check to see if it has one or not. Um, we would always assume that they do. Um, and we know that some in Angola definitely do. Um, and we have found elsewhere um, others. And we know, we know that it's quite a common practice. Um, but when we destroy in situ, it kind of solves the two problems at once. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.